Hello there and welcome to this live session of the Chemistry Clinic brought to you by Boost Revision. I'm Dr. Uwusi. In today's session we're going to be looking at practical chemistry again and we will be looking specifically at rates of reactions and the initial rates method. In uh, our session from a couple of weeks ago we looked at continuously monitoring the rate of a reaction. This time round we're going to be looking at initial rates and as usual towards the end of the session we will be looking at real exam, uh, pass exam questions that test your understanding of this particular aspect of reaction rates. Um, as usual, I will um, pause at different uh, points during the session to answer any questions you may have. If you do, please use the chat box and I will stop to answer these questions for you. Before we start, I will uh, connect my tablet and then we will be ready to go. So do bear with me for a few seconds while I do that. Okay, so hopefully you should see on your screens the title page, Practical Chemistry, Rates of Reactions, Initial Rates. Um, this would be PAG 10 on the OCR course. Okay, so in our session from two weeks ago, where we looked at what the rate of a reaction is. And just to recap, it is, of course, a change in the concentration of a reactant or product over time. So I've got a generic um, reaction on the screen, A being converted to B. And to measure the rate of this reaction, we can measure the change in the concentration of A, which is, of course, our reactant. And over time, uh, we could also measure the change in the concentration of B, which is our product. OK, so um, if we consider the first graph here, um, because you've got A as our reactant, um, A is going to reduce in concentration over the duration of the reaction. And as you can see there, we've got a curve that's sort of falls towards the x-axis, showing the decrease in concentration of A over time. Starts off quite steeply um, to begin with, indicating that you've got a very fast rate of reaction at the beginning, and that rate of reaction slows down. Conversely, we can look at the um, change in concentration of our product B as it's formed over time. And again, we can see that the um, initial uh, uh, rate um, is very high, and then the rate of uh, uh, formation of B slows down. As you can see there, um, you can see that your um, graph is flattening off um, as time progresses. Okay, so um, to refresh our, our uh, sort of, uh, memories on the definition of the rate of reaction, it is a change in concentration. So always a change in concentration of a reactant or product um, over time. So there we go. And of course, you can express this mathematically as um, delta concentration of A or B um, over uh, time. Okay, so we also learned in our last uh, uh, session on rates that the rate at any point in time can be measured or obtained by calculating the gradient at that point. Okay, so it is um, important that you are able to um, calculate uh, the, the uh, draw tangents to the curve and to calculate the gradient um, for um, for that tangent at that point um, on your curve. So for instance, if you wanted to um, calculate the, um, the concentrate the, the rate of your um, reaction at time x, which I will mark on the um, x-axis, we would need to draw a tangent to that point on our curve. And of course, um, the tangent has to be as straight a line as possible. Um, not doing a fantastic job with my tangent, but I'm sure you can do a lot better than that. Um, so you would then need to calculate the gradient of that tangent drawn there. So change in y over the change in x to give you the rate of the reaction at time equals x. Okay, so um, you can measure um, or calculate the rate of uh, this reaction at any time, any point in time by drawing a tangent to the curve and calculating the gradient of that tangent. Okay, so in today's um, session, we're going to take a, a different look at how to obtain the rate. Okay, so, so far we've talked about continuous monitoring of the rate of the reaction, and we've just said that if you want to calculate the rate um, at time equals x, you need to draw a tangent to um, the curve at t equals x. 
if you wanted to um, get the rate at t equals, um, let's call that maybe y, you would need to draw a tangent to the curve at that point and then calculate the gradient. Makes it all of that will allow you to work out the rate at any one particular uh, point in time. And then you can look at how um, the rate um, or what the rate of reaction or what the relationship of that rate of reaction is um, with, with, with the concentration of your um, reactant or your product. A different approach is to look at the initial rate of your reaction. Now, the initial rate refers to the rate at the very beginning of our reaction. In effect, the rate where T is equal to zero. You know, there are a number of reasons we want to do this, and that's because um, the very beginning is the only point at which we know the concentration of our reactant or product very accurately. Okay, so um, in this uh, concentration time graph at t equals zero, we can say exactly what the concentration of A is. In other words, the starting concentration of A. Now you can imagine A being, say, hydrogen peroxide decomposing into um, oxygen and water, which we will look at, and we'll look at that specific example shortly. So we know the um, we know the uh, concentration of our reactant very accurately at t equals zero. The other thing to point out, and the other thing to note, is that if we consider the very beginning of our reaction and not too far into the progress of the reaction, you should be able to see that the um, the gradient or the rather the curve is pretty much linear at the very beginning. So if we draw um, a tangent to the curve at t equals zero, which I will do in a different color, pick green. Okay, so that green line there drawn um, to the curve at t equals zero, um, gives us, allows us to calculate the initial rate of this particular uh, reaction. Now, imagine a scenario where you, you start off with a concentration of A and you get the curve that is shown on our screen. And then we decide to see how changing the concentration of A affects the um, initial uh, rate of our reaction. So um, we could um, potentially have a second um, second curve where this time around we've uh, perhaps doubled the concentration of A um, and have obtained a curve that looks like that in purple. Okay, so, um, and we're assuming here that uh, we've doubled the concentration but um, have um, kept the volume the same. Like, so we're going to end up, um, uh, we're, we're going to end up producing the same amount of uh, product B in this instance. Okay, so this time round, again, you should be able to see, and if we use green again to draw our tangent to uh, t equals zero, you should be able to, and if we um, use a straight line instead, so do that and try again. Okay, so not quite, not, not the greatest of uh, gradients uh, shown there. Um, this is uh, one of the drawbacks of using a tablet and not having a, a ruler to actually uh, draw the tangent uh, properly. Um, let's, uh, let's give it one more go and see if we can make a better, do, a, do a better job of, uh, of drawing our tangent. Let's sign round. Well, it's perhaps too vertical. Let's try that. Ah, there we go. That might be a little bit better. Let's do that again. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we've managed it. Um, sort of at the sort of fifth time of uh of, of of trying. So you can see that the second gradient uh for the purple line uh for the purple curve is much steeper because we have increased the concentration of a. Okay. Now, remember, if we're looking at the initial rate, then we will be um sort of looking at sort of perhaps uh, the production of a, of, a, of a fixed amount of um, our product B, or um, we're looking at the time taken to reduce the concentration of our reactant A by um, a small amount um, right at the beginning of the, um, of the experiment. Okay, so what we can do is 
perhaps measure um, the time taken to um, to uh, sort of lose a fixed amount of A. So let's say concentration of A, um, let's call it A, A prime. Okay, so what we can do or what we can see um, in this instance is that the um, concentrate uh, the rate of the reaction is inversely proportional to um, the time taken to get to that fixed uh, um, sort of concentration of A, which we've called A prime. Okay, so um, you've got a um, essentially an equation that says rate is proportional to one over time. Okay, so um, the longer it takes uh, to get to um, to that uh, particular uh, concentration, the slower the reaction is. And so for the red um, curve, you can see that it takes um, so roughly to, to double the uh, amount of uh, time to um, get to A prime as it does for the purple curve. Okay, so um, that's what we're doing when we look at the initial rates method. Okay, so to uh, recap, how do we obtain the um, initial rates method? Well, the first thing we can do is measure the gradient at t equals zero for a continuous monitoring uh, uh, concentration versus time graph, which we've just seen on the previous um, uh, page. And we can highlight that, so by measuring the gradient at t equals zero for a concentration versus time graph. And there is a second uh, method that uh, we can also use. Um, this is often referred to as a clock reaction, where we uh, measure the time taken to reach a fixed amount of product, as I discussed on the previous um, page. And at the point where you make this fixed amount of product, product there is a distinct sort of color change often associated with the reaction, which tells you that you've reached that point and you can stop the clock. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail to look at how we can obtain the initial rate um, from that sort of experiment. But back to what we were discussing on the previous um, slide, um, let's look at a real life example um, where you could um, produce concentration time graphs for a reaction and then use gradients at t equals zero to measure the initial rate. So you will first have come across this particular reaction where hydrogen peroxide decomposes to give you oxygen and water at GCSC. Anyway, this is a very useful experiment to study if you're continuously monitoring um, uh, a, a, a reaction, okay? because we can um, measure um, very uh, uh, sort of, uh, quite easily um, the amount of product uh, being formed over time, in this case, oxygen. So we can collect the oxygen and the gas range, for instance, and that allows us to obtain curves such as these three that we've got drawn here. Okay, so we can see that in the first instance where hydrogen peroxide, um, I've, I've labeled as A, um, hydrogen peroxide is A, you can see, um, sorry, I've, 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 I've not quite, uh, um, A should be um, not hydrogen peroxide, but oxygen, so we can change that, there we go. So, um, so we're, we're measuring the volume of oxygen being produced over time as hydrogen peroxide decomposes. And so you've got um, the first graph uh, where you've got the concentration um, of hydrogen peroxide um, being uh, uh, so hydrogen peroxide um, being the highest, and you can see that it's got the um, steepest uh, gradient um, to start with. So if we're, if we're calculating the initial rate, you would expect it to have the highest initial rate. And then you've got um, a scenario where uh, the concentration um, uh, is. Um, I'm sort of getting a bit muddled up in today's uh, uh, session. Um, what we're looking at, so the curves represent the volume of oxygen being um, uh, being uh, collected. And A, yes, I was right uh, so to start with, um, is um, actually uh, the different uh, concentrations of hydrogen peroxide um, that we're using um, to then um, check what the initial rate is. Okay, so if we uh, do for, forgive my uh, slight scattiness. Um, okay, so where um, you've got um, the highest concentration of hydrogen peroxide, you can see the volume of oxygen um, um, being collected is the highest. And here we're assuming that the, uh, uh, the volume of our uh, sort of, uh, 
solution of hydrogen peroxide is the same in all three um, instances. So um, you've got the steepest gradient here um, showing um, that you, you're starting off at the highest concentration of hydrogen peroxide. And then where the hydrogen peroxide concentration is halved, um, but using the same uh, volume of solution, you can see that you've got a, a slower rate of reaction, a slower initial rate. And you can see that the concentration of hydrogen peroxide is, is half in, in this instance. And so the final volume of oxygen, um, so this levels off there at, at half the um, original volume for the red um, graph. And if you've got um, a quarter of the original concentration, so we're looking at um, A over four, um, then you're going to have the, a quarter of the total uh, volume uh, produced in A as your final volume. And you will also see that you've got a, um, a, a, a quarter of the initial uh, uh, rate in, in this instance. Okay, or certainly, but if not a quarter, um, uh, so less than um, half of the, of the initial rate um, compared to um, the purple color. Okay, so um, in all three cases, we can calculate or uh, draw tangents to the curves at t equals zero. Okay, so uh, to give you an example, um, you can draw um, a tangent to that red curve there. And you can draw a tangent to the purple curve. And you can draw another tangent to the green curve. And each of those um, three tangents and the gradients of those tangents will give you the initial rate for um, the reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so that's one uh, way of, uh, of finding the initial rate of, of our reaction. Now, as we suggested earlier, the um, initial rate or the rate um, at the very beginning is proportional to um, one over time. So it's inverse, inversely uh, proportional to time. So what you can do is measure a fixed, um, measure the time taken to make a fixed um, amount of product, for instance. And if you can determine exactly when that fixed amount has been made, what you have is a clock reaction. So we're looking at this second um, well, I'll undo that for a second. We're looking at this second um, type of uh, uh, reaction, or, or rather second method where you can measure the initial rate. And in this specific example, we're looking at the reaction between hydrogen peroxide again and iodide ions in the presence of acid to produce iodine and water. Okay, so this is a, a, a redox um, a reaction. Now, what we're doing is measuring the time taken to make a fixed amount of iodine. How are we going to know um, that iodine has been made? Well, we're going to put starch into our reaction mixture as an indicator. We know that iodine, when formed, will complex to starch. And when it does so, um, you're going to get a blue-black color. OK, now, if we have our starch present at the, at the start, and we make our iodine, we would expect that the blue black color will occur instantaneously. Okay, so we wouldn't be um, able to measure um, a small amount of iodine being produced sort of just beyond um, sort of the start of the reaction. It would go blue black instantly, which means that what we want to do, um, so um, if we were considering um, a graph, um, let's say of, of iodine being produced, let's pretend that these curves our ID being produced. What we want is um, a time not very far from the beginning, at about there, where a fixed amount of our iodine has been made. And perhaps it's best to um, sketch a quick um, graph to illustrate this. So um, we have a Y and X axis, and we've got the amount of iodine being formed there and we've got um, time okay and then if we have so one reaction there and if we have another reaction there what we want to do is measure the time taken for a small amount of iodine there 
to be formed in the linear part of our two curves because that would allow us to uh, measure the initial rate. If we go beyond um, this little box here to about there, you can see that the, the, the curve is no longer linear, it de deviates from being linear. So we wouldn't be measuring or calculating the initial rate. Okay, so um, what we want to do is um, measure or calculate at the time taken to, um, or measure the time taken to produce this amount of our, this amount of our iodine. Okay, so we want these two different times here, you've got T1 and T2. Okay, so those are the two, um, those are the, the, the two times that you would measure. Of course, they are um, inversely proportional to the rate, the, the initial rate. So um, all you would need to do is take one over T to get the rate of the reaction at that point. So let's look at the practicalities of doing this particular, um, uh, this particular uh, uh, clock reaction. Okay, so in our, um, in our uh, experiment, what you would have would be um, a number of burettes for each of the substances you're going to be um, using in your um, reaction. And what you want to do is to measure accurately um, the different volumes. So in this instance, um, we're keeping um, the uh, volume of sulfuric acid um, constant for the five uh, different experiments you can see here. Um, and we, we are what we are doing is investigating the um, uh, how the concentration of our iodide um, affects the initial rate. And so you can see how the uh, volume of iodide used is uh, changed for each experiment. And in order to ensure that the concentrations of all the other substances remain the same, you do need to make up the rest of your solution with different volumes of water. Okay, so if we start from the very bottom row where you've got um, 25 centimeters cubed of acid, one milliliter of starch, no water at all, 25 um, uh, milliliters of um, iodide. So we're, we're at the maximum concentration of iodide. You've got five um, centimeters cubed of fire sulfate. Um, you're going to put all of these together into um, your reaction flask and your reaction is going to be started by adding 10 centimeters cubed of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so we start with 25 centimeters cubed of iodide. We go down to 20 centimeters cubed, so a relative concentration of so 0.8 or about 80% of the original concentration. That means that we need to make up the rest of the volume, uh, the missing five centimeters cubed here with water, okay? And if we reduce the uh, volume of iodide to 15, we need to make up the difference um, of 10 centimeters cubed by adding 10 centimeters cubed of water and so on. Okay, so this table um, shows you how uh, the concentration of all the other substances apart from the iodide are kept constant um, by um, making up the rest of the volume with water so that your total volume is always the same. So if you look across each row, you should find that the total volume is five plus five, that's 10, plus 20, that's 30, plus that is 55, plus one, that's 56. So you should find you've got 56 um, for all of your, uh, um, for, for the total volume for all of your experiments, okay? Now, what is the role of thiosulfate in this experiment? We know that hydrogen peroxide is going to be reacting with iodide and the presence of our acid um, to form iodine and um, water, okay? If we don't have any thiosulfate present, then as soon as iodine is formed, which would be a split second after the reaction starts, your um, starch is going to um, your starch is going to turn the um, uh, reaction mixture blue-black. It's going to complex to the iodine. And so what we haven't done is produced enough of our um, iodine. Okay, so we want to produce a small amount of, of iodine, measurable amount of iodine, not um, sort of the first iodine that forms, which of course the reaction to go blue-black instantly. Okay, so the way to do that is to add your thiosulfate and as soon as any iodine is formed, that iodine reacts with thiosulfate and it gets removed. The iodine gets removed by thiosulfate. So if we add a known amount of thiosulfate, 
Okay, so it's a fixed amount of thiosulfate um, to mop up the iodine that is being made. As soon as the thiosulfate has run out, your um, reaction will go blue-black because the iodine will react with the starch instead of your thiosulfate. Okay, like so that's when you know that you've made that small amount of iodine um, that is um, sort of being measured. You've, you've taken, you've measured the time taken to make that fixed amount of iodine that would mop up or use up your um, thiosulfate, um, which you, you, you um, added to your um, reaction mixture. Okay, so the thiosulfate is, is simply present to allow us to um, know when um, you've made a fixed amount of um, iodine, because as soon as the thiosulfate has run out, iodine complexes with starch and the reaction mixture goes blue black. And as a result, you can stop your clock and know the time taken to um, make that fixed amount of iodine. And it's important um, to note the molar ratio of your thiosulfate to your iodine. There you go. So the um, thiosulfate um, is going to mop up half um, the number of moles of, of, of iodine as, as itself. Okay, so you know the time taken to make um, half the moles of um, thiosulfate in iodine. Okay, so that is sort of um, a typical clock reaction at um, A level. Um, now, another way of, of, of working out uh, uh, orders with respect to a reactant is to do the sort of uh, clock reaction that we've just been looking at, okay? And once you've, uh, once you've, you've carried out uh, your, um, uh, clock, uh, your, your clock reaction, what you can do is um, plot a, a graph of, of rate um, or log of the rate um, which you've, you know, you've, you've found out. So remember, you're measuring the time and then you're taking the reciprocal one over time to give you um, the, the rate. Okay, so if you measure the time for each of these, um, we could um, add another column here. So we could say, could call that, let's call that time in seconds. And whatever your values are in that column. And in the final column, you could have another um, rate, which would be simply one over time. Um, and units of per second. So you could add those two uh, columns to um, your uh, uh, table. So in other words, you're measuring the time taken for your reaction mixture to go blue-black. And when it does so, um, you've got the time, which you can take the reciprocal of to give you the rate. Okay, so once you've done that, you can plot a graph of the log of your rate against the um, log of the concentration of iodide for that particular uh, uh, experiment, for that particular concentration of iodide. And that allows you to work out what the order is. And that is because the um, rate um, is related to the concentration of um, a particular reactant by this equation. So um, the rate is um, equal to the rate constant, which is given the symbol K. Um, times the concentration of our reactant, in this case, the iodide um, ion, raised to the power n, where n is the order of, of the reaction. The order of the reaction tells us by how much the rate um, will change when that concentration of our, um, of our reactant uh, changes. Okay, so um, this is a very important uh, equation to, um, to, uh, to, to to bear in mind. And of course, you can take um, logs of both sides to make it um, into a linear um, equation. So if you take logs of both sides, you'd have the log of rate um, being equal to the log of our rate constant. Plus, because we're multiplying k by the concentration of pi minus, when you take the log of this part of our um, equation, it's going to be plus sign um, and n log of our pi minus concentration. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to recognize this um, equation as being um, linear and y would be the log of the rate and n would be the gradient, so m and x would be log of the concentration of iodide 
and C, the Y intercept would be um, log K. Okay, so you now have a, um, an equation um, that is uh, linear, and if you plot log of rate against the um, log concentration of iodide, so log of rate versus our iodide, log of iodide concentration, you should get um, a straight line whose gradient is equal to N, and N is, of course, the order um, with respect to iodide. Okay, so... That's the order with respect to um, the iodide ions. And you can do this for all the other reactants in your, um, in your experiment um, by changing the concentration of that particular reactant while keeping all the others um, the same and plotting um, a graph of log rate um, against um, the log iodide um, or rather log um, reactant concentration to get the order. Okay. Now, there, are, um, there is another way of, of working out the order with respect to the reactant, and that's by looking at data tables um, containing um, the initial rate and changes in concentration. And I've got two examples on our screens um, to, um, to work through. Um, before we do that, I'm going to very quickly check to see if there are any um, questions. Um, okay, so there aren't any of a minute, so what I do is... Okay, so there are, there are no questions. What we'll do is carry on with our um, work to look at calculating the um, order um, with respect to different reactants in our uh, reaction. And this time using data tables containing concentrations and um, initial rates. Okay, so if we look at the first um, experiment here, um, we've got the concentration of R being one mole per decimeter cubed, the um, concentration of um, S being one mole per decimeter cube and the initial rate as a, real, as a result being 0 0.2 moles per decimeter cube per second. Now, working out the order requires you to compare at least two um, experiments um, in order to see how changing the concentration affects the initial rate. Okay, so if we look at experiment one and experiment two, you can see that the concentration of R is being doubled while the concentration of S is being kept constant. Good, so as a result of R being doubled, you can see that the initial rate has also been doubled. Okay, so um, in an exam, you could very speedily say that concentration of R goes up by a factor of two, so times two, and the, constant, uh, the initial rate as a result goes up by a factor of two, and if you have that relationship, um, that linear relationship, where doubling the concentration of the reactant doubles the rate, um, trebling the uh, concentration of the reactant trebles the rate, um, halving the concentration of the reactant halves the rate, then you have a first order relationship um, with respect to that reactant. So we've got first order with respect to R. Okay, now what we want to do is work out the order um, for um, S, and again, we need to therefore um, change the concentration of S, keep the concentration of uh, R hopefully uh, uh, constant, and see how that affects the rate. So if we do that, so we're looking at S this time round, and the two, um, the two uh, experiments we would want to uh, compare would be one and three, so you see that one and three, um, you've got the same concentration of R, but a doubling in the concentration of S. Okay, so if we look at one and three, we've got a doubling of concentration of S, but as we can see here, the rate does not change at all. Okay, so no change in the rate. Now, in instances where um, the rate of the uh, reaction is not influenced by the concentration of a particular reactant, 
we say that that reaction is zero order. Change in concentration does not affect the um, initial rate. Okay, so um, we need to say that it is zero order with respect to S. Okay, now if we look at the um, second example, um, the similar exercise, um, we've got initial concentrations of T and U being one mole per decimeter cubed and an initial rate given as 0 0.5. In experiment five, the initial concentration of T is halved. So you've got So times by a factor of a half, so halved. And as a result, your initial rate also halves. Okay, so we can again say that T is first order. And then we can do a similar exercise um, with uh, U. So we're looking at changing the concentration of uh, U this time. So. Um, if we um, look for two convenient um, experiments to use, um, so we're looking at an initial concentration of one, which then gets um, doubled. And we've got an initial concentration of, um, well, in this instance, um, the concentration of T is not being kept constant um, in any of the um, experiments. Um, so we, things are a little bit trickier, but we can still work our way through it because we have already worked out that T is first order. Okay? So we know that if we increase um, the concentration of T by um, a factor of um, two, we should expect the um, rate um, to um, double. Okay, so let's look at this um, in, in a bit more uh, detail. So T increases by Two, so looking at four and five, so looking at four and six, I should say. So if we're looking at just the um, influence of T on the rate of reaction, we would expect the initial rate to go up by two, by a factor of two to double. So um, initial rate due to T, Increase in initial rate due to T is two times, therefore 1.0 to start with. Okay, so we've doubled the concentration of T from one to two, so we would expect the initial rate to go from 0 0.5 to one. Okay, now we've also doubled the initial uh, 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 concentration of U from one to two. Okay, but doing that, more than doubles the initial rate. So doubling U, however, causes initial rate to increase by two to the power two. Okay, so increases by a factor of four, which is um, two raised to the power two, therefore U is second order. Okay, so if we look at it again, if we look at that, that's times two, and that is times two. We know that this will have a doubling effect on the rate, which would take that from 0 0.5 to one, but we don't have one here, we've got four. Okay, so doubling that increases that initial rate by a factor of four. Okay, so um, we've got two to the power two, and so um, you've got a second order um, reaction with respect to you. Okay, so you should be able to um, carry out these sorts of uh, uh, 
sets of deductions to get the order with respect to reactants by comparing different experiments and um, how the concentration, um, how the change in concentration affects the um, initial rate. Now, the final thing I want to look at as far as uh, sort of theoretical um, uh, stuff goes is uh, the relationship between temperature and the rate of the reaction. As we all know, um, a small increase in, in, in the temperature has a, a very large effect on the, uh, the rate of the reaction. And that can be explained by the Arrhenius equation. As you can see there, there is an exponential relationship between our uh, temperature and rate, um, um, or in this case, the, the, the rate constant and the temperature. Of course, the rate constant is proportional to um, uh, the rates, as, as I've said here, so um, we can use the two interchangeably. So there is an exponential relationship. If you increase the temperature by a small amount, you get a much, much larger increase in the rate of our reaction. Now, if we take this relationship here, we can turn it into a linear um, equation. So we can take um, logs of both sides. This time we can take the natural log, which is log to the base E. And so log to the base E or lin K gives you that. And then, of course, that would give you uh, on this side, lin A. And because we're multiplying A by E raised to that power, um, it would be plus and then minus EA over RT. So you've got a plus and a minus here, which, of course, is a minus. Um, and the natural log of E is 1. So we don't um, sort of write that in, obviously. So um, lin A minus EA over RT. Now, you would very likely be given this equation, so you wouldn't need to know how to take the logs of both sides to get to the linear uh, form which we've got here. I've rewritten the linear form um, by separating out these uh, terms here to, so that you've got, it's a more obvious, uh, it's more obvious that you've got a linear uh, um, equation. So you've got y here, and then you've got the gradient, which is Ea over r, and you write that in. Think. And x is 1 over t. Okay. And of course, uh, c is our uh, natural log of a. Okay. So you can plot a graph of the natural log of um, k um, or the natural log of rate. Um, remember, they are proportional to each other. So um, you can plot this graph here where you've got lin k um, on the y axis and uh, 1 over t on the x axis. So y. Um, versus x, and that will give you um, a, a straight line whose gradient is equal to minus Ea over R. Okay, so that allows you to, um, and R of course is the molar gas constant, value 8.31, and so that allows you to work out the activation energy for a particular uh, uh, reaction. Okay, so this um, equation here, uh, the Arrhenius equation, allows us to work out the calculate the activation energy. Okay, so um, we'll put all of this into practice um, in our um, exam question. We're going to uh, focus perhaps more on that first uh, question there from the 2018 paper, um, question 17, paper one of the A-level 2018 um, series, and put into practice everything we've just been looking at. Okay, so uh, this question is about reaction rates, and we're told that the aqueous um, iron three ions, Fe three plus uh, aqueous reactive aqueous iodide ions, is shown below. We've got the overall equation given here. Um, a student carries out three experiments to investigate how different concentrations of the Fe three plus ions and I minus ions affect the initial rate of this reaction. Okay, so three different experiments, um, three different initial rates and of course varying the concentrations of the Fe3 plus and iodide ions. Okay, so what this should allow us to do is um, work out the orders with respect to Fe3 plus and I minus and as a result get a rate equation. So that's where we're going to start. Um, it says determine the rate constant and a possible two-step mechanism for this reaction. How do we do that? Well we need to start by working out the orders with respect to the different um, uh, species present. Thank you. So let's look at the first experiment. We've got four times 10 to the minus two, three times 10 to the minus two, and an initial rate of 8.1 times 10 to the minus four. In the second experiment, we're doubling the 
concentration of MP3 plus, keeping I minus the same. Okay, so if we show that we know that this is being doubled and to work out what happens to the initial rate as a result. So we've got 1.62 divided by 8.10. the minus four. Okay, so that is um, gone up by, uh, has gone up by a, a factor of two as well. So we know that it's first order with respect to Fe3 plus ions. The next thing we need to do is work out um, what order it is for iodide ions. And we can do this in a different color. Um, so for the iodide ions, you've got, um, again, if we um, compare, um, so now let's see, um, if we compare um, one and three, you can say we can compare one and three because iron Fe3 plus is being kept constant, as you can see there, whereas iodide is being changed. Okay, so that's the most convenient uh, thing to do. So again, doubling the concentration of iodide ions um, and what's happening to the rate? Let me find out. So this is times two. What happens to the rate? So three point two four times seven minus three divided by eight point one minus four. Okay, so that's gone up by a factor of four. So we've got two to the power of two. So second order. with respect to I minus. Okay, so that's um, the first two marks in this, um, in this question, um, sort of um, very quickly sort of dealt with. And um, the next thing to do, um, possibly not quite done with the first two marks, is we need to write a rate equation. So the next thing to do is say that the rate is equal to the rate constant, of course, times um, we know it's first order with respect to Fe3 plus. So there we go. And it's second order with respect to I minus, so to the power two, so the square of the um, iodide concentration. Okay, so that's our rate equation, and that should deal with the first um, uh, to two. Um, the first two marks. Now, remember, the question wants us to determine the rate constant. So what we need to do is rearrange this equation. So the rate constant is going to be equal to um, the rate divided by Fe3 plus concentration times the square of I minus concentration. OK, so that's um, the equation to get the rate constant. And what we can do is take the data for experiment one um, and if we plug that into this equation. So the rate for experiment one is 8.1 times 10 to the minus four. That's going to be divided by concentration of Fe3 plus, which is four times 10 to the minus two times the square of the concentration of I minus, which is three times 10 to the minus two raised to the power of two, okay? And if we uh, do that, we've got four, yes, three, minus two, we square that. And the answer times four exponent minus two. Okay, and then if we divide 8.1, times 10 to the minus four by the answer. We get 22.5, 22.5. And of course we need units for our rate constant. Um, the units of um, rate are moles per decimeter cube per second. The units of concentration here are moles per decimeter cube. So those two cancel out. And what you're going to be left with is per second at the top and mole, um, so in this instance, mole squared 
dm to the minus six at the bottom. And so if we take that up, it should be got per second, mole to minus two dm to the six. Okay, so that's our uh, rate constant calculated. And we now, given that we've got a rate equation, should be able to come up with um, a, a mechanism for this uh, reaction. We know that the uh, rate determining step involves the species of the rate equation. So if we look at our rate equation there, we will have two iodide um, ions and our Fe3 plus involved in the rate determining step. So we can write the equation here where we have Fe3 plus reacting with iodide, which uh, two I minuses um, to give us um, what we can say is that you would make FeI2 and it would have a plus charge. Okay, so we're going to make this intermediate species here using, um, so this is the rate determining step, so RDS, um, using all of the species in our rate equation. So species in our rate equation are these here. Okay, so once we've done that, we know that this intermediate isn't a final product, so it has to be used up. We know that there is a, from the um, overall equation, there is a second mole of Fe3 plus that hasn't been used up yet. So if we go down to the second line and use a second mole of Fe3 plus and react that with our Fe. FeI2 plus, we know that what we can do is for our Fe2 plus and what we can also do is uh, form I2 and of course we would need to have two Fe2 pluses being formed so that the charges are balanced. So if we look at the overall charge, you've got two plus there, you've got three plus and one plus there. And so you've got four pluses on both sides. Um, you've got uh, two Fe species here, you've got two Fe species there, you've got I2 and I2. Okay, so those two um, steps, when summed up, should give us the overall equation which is two Fe3 pluses so these two here plus two I minuses to give us the two Fe2 pluses on the right and I2. Okay so that's our uh, six marks um, well earned um, and if we look at the final part of this um, uh, uh, of this uh, question um, in part B, it says a student carries out an, invest an investigation to find the activation energy and the pre-exponential factor A of a reaction. Now, to remind ourselves, the pre-exponential factor is, if we go back to our Arrhenius equation, is this um, species here, A. And so the natural log of A is the natural log of that pre-exponential factor. Now, um, although we don't really delve too deeply into it, it, it the pre-exponential factor tells us um, a, a lot about the reaction, especially uh, it sort of wraps up things such as the orientation of collisions in, 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 a, in a reaction leading to a successful uh, formation of product. Okay, so uh, the pre-exponential factor is going to be obtained by getting the y-intercept. Okay, now, if we look at uh, this question, um, we want to uh, find the activation energy and the pre-exponential factor A of the reaction. The student determines the rate constant K at different temperatures and and then the student, so we've, uh, as you can see there, we've got the rate constant or the natural log of the rate constant, which you can only plot if you've worked out what the rate constant is at different temperatures, and then the corresponding um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of inverse of the temperatures, so um, the reciprocal of the temperatures 
um, you've got down there on the x-axis. Okay, so um, the student then plots a graph of link k against 1 over t as shown. And the first thing we want to do is probably to get a line of best fit through these points. Okay, so we're going to again sort of um, hope that my ruler is, is, is straight enough and my eye is uh, obviously working uh, well enough. So if we draw a line of best fit through these points, um, not the greatest line of best fit, but it will it will do. Hopefully, we are well within range. Um, um, so um, that's our line of best fit, and what we want to do is to calculate the gradient of our line of best fit. Because remember, um, the if we uh, think about the Arrhenius equation, um, the, the gradient. If we go back a few slides. I'll write this out again um, for the Arrhenius equation. The gradient Ea over R or minus Ea over R is equal to uh, the gradient. Okay, so we can use that to work out the activation energy because we know what R is. It's in our data book, it's 8.3. Okay, so um, let's uh, calculate the gradient first. So if we pick um, this point here. The two points along our straight line, and if we pick that point up there, we call the coordinates of this point are we've got four point zero. That's not four point zero, actually four point five. Four point five times ten to the minus three, and on the y-axis, it's 27.24678.27.7. Okay, and the other coordinates up there are on the x-axis, we've got 0. And on the y-axis, we've got 31. One, two, three, four, five, thirty-one point five. Okay, so to calculate the gradient, it's the change in y. So m is equal to change in y, which is of course thirty-one point five minus twenty-seven point seven divided by as uh, zero minus four point five five seven minus three. 4.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so the gradient is equal to 3, which gives us minus 844.4, we'll call it minus 844. Okay, so that is our gradient. And so to calculate the activation energy, we know that the, um, the gradient is equal to minus Ea over R, and so minus Ea is equal to R, which is 8.31 times the gradient, which is what 844, I think it was, yeah, 844, minus 844. <coughs> and so Ea is equal to 8.31 times minus minus eight four four so plus eight four four which should give us seven thousand and seventeen. Okay, so seven thousand 
and 17 joules per mole. And then we're asked to use the graph to calculate the value of the pre-exponential factor. So we need to look for the y-intercept. So um, the y-intercept is, of course, there, and that is, expand on that, that is 31.50. So and back to our question. So y-intercept 31.50. Yeah, okay, so that is our pre-exponential factor um, given as 31.5. So, um, so we want the, uh, so the pre-exponential factor is A, um, but what we've got is 31.5 um, um, as a natural log of um, A. Okay, so um, if we unlog that, so if we, okay, A, <clears throat> natural log of a shift e 31.5 which is 4.78 or 4.79 Okay, and we can double check the answer um, given there. So, we're looking at the 2017 paper, I believe it was question 17, possibly. There we go. So 4.33 times um, 10 of 2018 paper, I should have said. So, yep. So we are well within um, well within range. So 4.33 um, times 10 to the 13 um, or e to the power 31.4. Of course, we've said it's e to the power 31.5. OK, so um, that was a pretty uh, challenging uh, sort of uh, question, but if you are sort of thorough and systematic in your approach to uh, solving it, then um, things uh, become easier and you do pick up most of the marks, if not all of the marks. Um, unfortunately, it's time to uh, bring this session to um, a close. Um, it's been a pleasure, as, as usual, to go through um, uh, these uh, uh, sort of questions and these theoretical uh, sort of and practical points uh, with you. Um, if there are any questions at all on uh, this session, then please do drop us a line at boostrevision.com and we'll be more than happy to get back to you with answers to your um, problems. For now, I will say goodbye. It's been a pleasure. I'm Dr. Rusu and I will see you soon. Thank you very much.